You're listening to Everyday Engineering, the City of Madison's engineering podcast where we talk about infrastructure. Complex topics explained simply. From the water that flows down your drain to the rain and snow that drains into the lakes. By way, the curbs and streets we design. City engineering touches your life in so many ways. Explained right now in Everyday Engineering. Thank you everyone for listening in with us on our very first podcast ever from the City of Madison Engineering Division. And before you think this is going to be too complex or think, oh, I'm not an engineer, this isn't for me, stop, keep listening, and don't worry. This podcast is a resource for you, complex topics explained simply. So our podcast is named Everyday Engineering because for our division, it's what we do. It's the impact we have on the city we all love to live, work, grow, and play in. So every other week, we're going to tackle topics that impact you from an infrastructure standpoint. I'm Hannah Molinitsky, Public Information Officer for the City of Madison Engineering Division, here with my podcast partners in crime, Bill Gabler and Jojo O'Brien, both engineers for our division. Thanks for being here, both of you. Of course. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so this week, we're going to talk about flooding. You both were involved in last year's historic flooding in different ways, but can you kind of explain what happened and what you saw, and even more importantly, why? Yeah, so I can kick us off here. Um, (laughs) August 20th of last year, the city of Madison experienced 12 to 15 inches of rain in some portions of the city, um, specifically on the west side. So that led to some flash flooding. And then the secondary issue with that was that so much water came into the Yohara Lake system that we ended up seeing some lake level flooding. And I'll let Phil talk a little bit about why we saw that. And one of the other things that happened that day is we had a the sanitary sewers overflowed into the lakes. Mm -hmm. And so our first task was to go out and try to find what the cause of this, uh, all this water getting into the sanitary system was. Eventually we figured out it was water that got into underground parking because all those drains in the the basement of your underground parking go to the sanitary sewer. But it took us a while and we were out walking around and then we came back and we kind of realized the extent of the damage. And there were a lot of things that happened with that flooding. We had flash flooding and then after that flash flooding we had this lake level flooding where the lakes were super high Mm -hmm. and we had to address concerns around that so if we look at like flash flooding what causes that is just too much water that falls from the sky onto the landscape the streets your yard your roof and it can't get away fast enough some places in the city that's because we have the drains off of the road there's just not enough of them other places you have the water could get off the street fast enough, but the pipe that takes the water away is completely full. And then we, like, you come down in places like Middleton, the river was so full, the, mm-hmm. or the Pheasant Branch Creek was so full that it had to go over roads and mm-hmm. the culverts weren't big enough and took out that whole hillside. It was a mess. Yeah. And some of the reasons that we have pipes and such that can't carry water for a 12 to 15 inch rain event is that it's kind of impossible to design for. Um, So in the city of Madison in the past, we've designed to much smaller storms because you try to balance how expensive of infrastructure you want to put in the ground with how much water you want to be able to convey. So a lot of the pipes that we have in the ground were built before 1960, and those maybe had different design guidelines of how big they should be. Like It has changed so much since then. I think, you know, I've had a hand in working with both of you for the public information meetings that we had for the watershed, but I am blown away by just how drastically different this sewer, the storm sewer has changed over time. I guess that's something that I don't think the public knows. And can you kind of explain why is that? Why is that? Why has it changed so much? And why, why do we care? I'll I'll take this. I think there's a few, (laughs) a few reasons why it's changed so much. One is we have computers now and computers (laughs) make doing calculations a lot easier than doing them with uh, a slide rule and paper. (laughs) And also, I think we're better at manufacturing things. So the cost may have come down a little bit. So say, well, we're going to design for maybe four inches of rain, or maybe we can now design for six inches of rain. And the cost is a little bit different. You have a better handle of what actually is coming through that pipe. Where before, I think there were a lot of rules of thumb. There was a little bit of a, well, it's not that bad. What how much risk can we take? Do we all want to spend this much money on a pipe in the ground? And we now have changed our perception and we know that there's this risk if we have flooding. Mm -hmm. And 
especially if you have places where the water can't kind of spill over land, like either follow a road or follow a low point into a downstream body of water, mm -hmm. it's worth it to spend the money on the pipe. Yes. Yeah. Short answer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people saw the media coverage. We know one person lost their life in the waters and the city did press conferences and continuous communication throughout the whole event um, that spanned weeks, months. Um, what are some things the public didn't see so obviously you think that they should know? So one of the things right when the flooding happened is that we opened our emergency operations center mm -hmm. and the entire city responded. So this wasn't just engineering. This wasn't just the streets division. We had the parks division. We had the water utility. Um, everyone came to the table and tried to rally and figure out, you know, where we needed resources and what to respond to. We had about $4 million worth of public damage that we had to immediately try to make safe for the public. So that sidewalks that were washed away, streets that were washed away, et cetera. Um, and the response time from our crews was phenomenal. And then additionally, at the same time, we're helping all these citizens um, who had up to, we're guessing, $30 million worth of damages to their homes and trying to get them resources and help and be prepared for more rain that could have come. Um, there was kind of a really quick turnaround response time with that. Another thing is, <clears throat> on top of all this, right, kind of in the middle of this hurricane of activity and all these things going on, and then we decided to host you know, uh, the Iron Man. Right. That and so we have all right. these elite athletes that have spent a whole year of their life training yeah. or more mm -hmm. coming to Madison. They want to do their event. And the floodwaters didn't really agree with the route in a few places. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, how do we adjust for this and make sure that the race can go on? And decisions had to be made along that end, too. And uh, I would say to the city's credit and all the people involved that the race went off and you know, a few minor changes to the route. Yeah. But there were a lot of little side conversations. Well, do we go this way or do we try to stop the water here? You may have seen at the Monona Terrace, they put up the big sandbags and pump that water out mm -hmm. to keep the path open as opposed to shutting down John Nolan. That's just one example of decisions that were made. Yeah, I think like just gathering from both of you and, and really the point of this podcast is trying to kind of, you know, move the curtain aside and see, you know, in the minds of the people that are making these decisions, these life-saving decisions, and especially in crisis situations when engineers are, okay, what do we want to do here? How do we work with the Iron Man? How do we save, you know, hundreds of pe thousands of people from floodwaters, you know, and, and how do we help them in a thoughtful way? I think that that's like the purpose of what we do as a city. It's purpose to why we want to share this sort of perspective on the podcast. Um, so many moving parts. And, and another thing I wanted to point out is that I ended up being the volunteer coordinator for the sandbags. Yes. And that was a difficult task, a lot of moving pieces. We were coordinating to get sandbags to places where you know, our residents could take them and take them to their homes. Mm -hmm. We also had people who couldn't get sandbags to their house but needed them. And I think we had about maybe 10, I would call them super volunteers. They had a truck and said, I'm off work. I'm going to come help. Tell me what to do. And they basically ran their own little crews of volunteers. Wow. It was pretty inspiring to see. Yeah, absolutely. And additionally, we had our crews that were staffing all of those sandbags. So making sure that we had sand and that we had bags where people could get them, um, keeping those locations fully stocked. And then also the staff that went around and hung flyers on people's doors saying, hey, based on our mapping, based on what we know, you're at risk and you should think about sandbagging. So going around, letting people know that, and then following up to say, hey, you did a really good job here, or hey, actually, these sandbags aren't really protecting you in this way. Here's how you should be doing that. Um, so the amount of man hours that we had of engineers that are current or generally in the office doing design out on the ground, helping people one-on-one, -on -one, trying to ease through this transition and make sure that everyone was prepared as possible in case it did rain again. That isthmus is particularly vulnerable when our storm sewer is filled up with water because the Ohara River or Lake Monona is so high that the water can't move out of the sewer. It's actually moved up it and is flooding the isthmus that we felt as though people in that isthmus area were at an increased risk for flash flooding to an elevated extent than they normally would see. Also the National Guard. They had yeah. a crew here. I think there were 20 National Guardmen. And they, uh, it's pretty amazing when you can draw a line on a map and it turns into 5,000 sandbags in about three hours. Impre amazing. It's yeah. wild. 
but it was, it, it was pretty wild. Wild, but it gets done, and mm-hmm. and people come to the table. They they come, they they perform, they follow through. I think the follow through is where we go to next in this conversation, and it's very evident to me as this public information officer and working with all of the engineers that we haven't stopped working on looking for solutions or what happened or reflecting since the flooding last year. I mean, the work has not stopped since and really for the last few years. I mean, the flooding was obviously impactful uh, last summer, but it's been pretty heavy for the last three years. We've seen that in spots of the city. So we're working on these watershed studies and the public information meetings, and we're hearing from the public and people that are still dealing with the impacts from even just last summer. I think that's the biggest takeaway is it's still very real and it's still taxing financially, emotionally, and just from a whole big picture standpoint. So I guess, can you both speak to what's next? What's necessary as we move hopefully towards some solutions? Yeah. So um, I can speak to the lake level side a little bit. I've been working with the city and emergency management to try to prepare the city for how we would respond when lake levels rose to a dangerous level since 2017. So the city had done emergency management exercises. We'd done a lot of surveying to try to figure out what critical infrastructure was at risk. Um, And that was all done in advance of the flooding. Since then, we've been able to take what we've learned and try to create an even more robust plan to try to be more prepared and make essentially preparing the city be a little bit more smoother Mm -hmm. um, and have it get more materials and more resources to folks so that they can be more prepared in advance. Um, Additionally, what we found with the flash flooding is that we have problems throughout the city where people flood, have flooded in the past and definitely flooded in August. And trying to quantify how often people are at risk of flooding um, is pretty difficult with the information that we have. So one thing that we needed to do as an engineering division was take a step back and try to actually model to figure out what areas are at most risk. So to say a house that flooded in August compared to a different house that flooded in August, it's possible that both of these houses could have extremely different flood risks. One could be at risk of flooding 2% each year, and the other one could have a 50% chance of flooding each year. So trying to piece that together and figure out what those risks are is kind of what our next step is in being able to make decisions to prioritize fixing some of these problems. We can't wave a magic wand and solve all the Mm -hmm. flash flooding in the city, unfortunately. It'd be really great if we could, and (laughs) Phil and I probably wouldn't have jobs. (laughs) Um, However, (laughs) what we need to do is look at each of these areas that flooded really badly at a watershed scale. So a watershed is an area that all drains to a certain point, generally within the city, that's Lake Monona or Lake Mendota or one of our creeks or tributaries. And what we can do is we can model that whole area and try to figure out where it floods and how frequently it floods. And from there, actually put solutions into that model and see how that impacts the system and how much it can improve the flooding situation. Because one of the critical things that you have to be aware of when you put out alternatives and try to solve a flooding problem for one person mm-hmm. is that it might just move the problem downstream or in some cases backwater up onto somebody else's property that didn't have flood risk before and now they do because it wasn't a well thought out change so we're trying to avoid that mm-hmm. by having a, a an overall cohesive model that allows us to try out different solutions look at the cost and the benefit of these solutions and make sure that we don't just move a problem from point a to point b sure one way to think about that is all the water that maybe was in your basement if we keep it from going into your basement where's it going to go we don't just want to move it down the block to the next person's basement so unfortunately the areas that did flood actually are essentially what we would consider a storage area. So we can't just keep that water out. We need to plan out where that water is going to move to, make sure that it can handle it. Sure. And as we kind of move toward wrapping up the podcast, I know we could talk all day about this. I do have a couple of things I do want to ask you before we end today. Um, This podcast is a resource for our community, as we know that people are hungry for information about you know, flooding and what they can do to prevent. So uh, if anybody's worried about flooding or if they have flooded, can you kind of just bust through some of the things that they can do? Go home, do this, or maybe think of this. What are some options? So uh, one thing for sure that people uh, should, should look at doing is if you were someone who had to put out sandbags last time and you don't own a sump pump, Mm -hmm. Now would be a really good time to make that, what, 
120, $150 purchase, sure. a wall of sandbags is going to leak. Mm -hmm. It slows down the water coming into your house, but it doesn't stop it entirely. You need to have something on the downstream side of that wall to pump the water back out. Mm -hmm. It would be an awful situation if you have all your sandbags in place and then you have this slow leak and you just watch your basement fill up slowly. Oh. You don't want that. No, you do not want that. Anything else? Sump pump? Anything else, JoJo? So for people that experience flash flooding, um, there's different levels of flooding that you experience. A lot of people can either mitigate some of the flooding or prevent all flooding from entering their homes if they follow our flood prevention tips, which are posted online. Um, some of those things are as basic as making sure that your gutters are cleaned out or that they're functioning properly or... What I had to do at my house was make sure that the landscaping around my house was actually sloped away from it because sure. you don't want to be funneling water towards your house. A lot of people, it's kind of hard to see, um, especially if it's overgrown like my house was when I moved in. <laughs> but it's an important, easy step. And there's a bunch of different small, easy things that you can do to try to mitigate flooding at your house. And then we have a series of other like secondary steps that are slightly more expensive. But there's something there for everyone that they can be doing to try to make their house more flood resilient. Sure. And, and one thing I want to make note of, I noticed this in my neighborhood where we're pretty close to the lake and people had added sump pumps after August 20th and some of the contractors put the float, the trigger that turns the sump pump on too low. Mm -hmm. So they're essentially pumping lake water, hmm. which you're, you're not going to exhaust that supply of water. By moving that float up just below your basement floor, they were able to make it so it only cycled on when there was a rain event. Still have a dry basement, extra level of safety. You're not pumping the lake. Good takeaways. All good takeaways. All of those tips um, are online. And I'll give you the link in just a few minutes here. As we wrap up, one last question for both of you. Um, as we are nearing one year since the flood of last year, uh, what can we say we've learned? Um, one big thing that I learned was that everyone can and should have flood insurance, especially if they flooded last year or were close to flooding last year. Um, as the city, we reached out to a couple different insurance agents that had given us incorrect information to begin with. And as we learned a little bit more following the flood, we found out that anyone can get FEMA flood insurance, even if you're outside the floodplain. And a lot of insurance providers don't know that. And that's something that can be really valuable for folks. Um, additionally, there are other supplementary insurance options, such as private flood insurance or sump pump insurance and sanitary backup insurance that can be really helpful and help people to recover from flooding. So on top of doing those things that I was talking about previously to be prepared in advance, um, making sure that you're asking those right questions and getting the insurance that you need is really important. Phil? All right. So I think one of the, <laughs> one of the big things that I've learned is just how critical it is to maintain this system. Mm -hmm. right? We've seen, and maybe a little bit before that August 20th event, we saw that when things clog, all of our modeling efforts kind of go out the window a little bit and we were like well we don't know how much it clogged but we know that it did clog so residents can help us by not storing things in their greenway mm -hmm. uh, this includes cords of wood uh, you know playhouses grass clippings all those things can get stuck on a grate and when the grate gets clogged it doesn't work how it's designed so please keep your yard waste at the yard waste site <laughs> not in the greenways you heard it here on Everyday Engineering. This topic we are probably going to cover again, but from different angles. We know we want to cover things in the future and future podcasts, you know, private development, groundwater, lake level management. We could really go on and on and on, but for today, our time is up. But thank you both of you for being here. Uh, don't forget to check out the city's website, www.cityofmadison.com slash flooding. Um, again, from Sandbag Collection Plans, Flooding Resilience, everything you need to know about flooding, it's all there. Just click over to the city's website. Um, and again, for anyone listening, if you have more questions about this topic or anything else you'd like us to address, we'd love your questions. Feel free to call us in engineering or even more importantly, click over to our City of Madison Engineering Facebook page because we're here for you as a resource every day in engineering. We'll see you next time.